nice. Or this, you have an easy life against that too, if you play the classical with knight f6 and e takes f6. Because we can play, and I have to just go back for a moment because I've went for this move order in the course, it's a bit more common. Um, because we take and play knight f6 too. So we just go for the same idea. Quite often, now you will meet the move knight takes f6, when after e takes f6, we very often would simply transpose to a position that we have seen before, a harmless version of the classical. The better move for white, the more challenging move for white, is actually the move queen to e2, covering the e4 knight, keeping it in the middle of the board. Now you have a rare opportunity to lose quickly in our repertoire, and please avoid it. Knight bd7 is made in one move. It has happened hundreds, if not thousands of times. Don't do that. The danger <laughs> is a little bit that you want to take and then play knight d7. That is the sequence I'm recommending and that is fine for black. So just remember, take first, then knight d7. Don't play knight d7 immediately. Every time I get this in the blitz game, I really have to like, okay, take first, take first, take first. Don't do knight d7. <laughs> so you have to take first, queen takes, and now knight d7. The idea of knight d7 is that if we go back, Currently, the bishop cannot develop easily, and with knight d7, knight f6, we want to um, drive the white queen away from their dominating central position. Now, the most popular way for white to play is bishop c4, when we play knight f6, and now white goes for knight e5. It's understandable that this is a very popular line for white. It's attractive to let the queen hang for a moment. We cannot take it, of course, due to mate on f7. So we have to play e6, no other move. Queen e2, now it is hanging. It has to remove uh, from e4. And now, interesting, at first you might think, wait, isn't that a bit passive? Isn't black's position a little bit odd? We have this somewhat passive bishop here. That is not a problem though, because we are now playing the move b5. The bishop will have a good life later on b7 or in some cases on a6. We gain time on the white bishop. First of all, we have to check what happens if they take on c6. It turns out that this is not a good idea at all. We play queen c7, and after bishop takes b5, we have a direct win with a6, attacking the bishop, bishop a4, and bishop d7. Now the white knight cannot move as a4 is just dropping, and the only move that for the moment keeps the piece are queen moves. Queen f3, rook c8 is the end of the knight or the bishop. White can only choose which piece to lose. Or they can play queen c4. That is a little bit more testing, let's say. But after knight d5, still completely winning for black, as knight b6 is the key threat. White has no way to not lose a piece now. It's really a funny line. I've had this on the board multiple times in blitz chess. People sometimes still take on c6 thinking black has blundered, but it's not the case. b5 is just a good move. What they usually play, if they are knowledgeable, they play the bishop go to, going to b3. We play queen c7, now covering the pawn and preparing the move bishop d6. That is a good setup. We have lots of pressure on the knight. The knight, of course, has a nice position on e5, centralized, but it also is a little bit of a liability if we think about c5, which attacks the base pawn of the white knight. So what we want to do is we want, of course, castle, and then play with c5, attacking the center. So both sides were castle, and now white has some choice. They usually play c3 at some point, but they can also develop the bishop. We will check the move c3 here. 
as I said, there are plenty of possibilities, but it does not really change all that much what Black wants to do. So we look at one um, sample line, but Black's play would look similar in other cases too. A move that needs um, a different answer is bishop g5, though. I just want to mention that briefly. When we go away, or we should go away, preventing the double pawn here that white cannot take. With the knight moving away, we also threaten f6 now ourselves, forking two pieces. So remember, if they play bishop g5, we want to go to d5, avoid the f6 capture, and get this on the road as well. So more often than not, something like c3 will happen. And now the immediate c5 would um, offer the b5 pawn. We don't want to do that. We have an easier way of doing it. We can play a5 and only now c5. The point is that now queen takes b5 can be answered with bishop a6, which is the point of the a5 move so that we have this square under control. And here, I think um, Black's chances are absolutely fine. The setup that we have, like this with the three pawns, can also happen in various other forms, like white having played rook d1 before, stuff like that. There's some flexibility here. Um, so d takes d5 is what they usually do when we take with the queen, avoiding this tactic. Yeah, Don't do that. So we take with the queen. Rook d1, and now a final move that is nice to, to know um, in such a structure is bishop to c7, removing the bishop from the scope here of the two pieces of bishop on f4 and the rook on d1. I said it's a tactically somewhat unreliable position. With bishop c7, we're totally safe. Yeah, and here, this um, type of position is completely fine for black. All of our pieces work well. Our bishop has a good spot on b7 or sometimes on a6. The only thing that we have to be aware of is that white has still, we have to unpaint, a bit of pressure here on f7. And we want to be a bit cautious there. Yeah, not running into a silly, make a sacrifice on f7 or, some, or something like that. It's um, definitely something to watch out for. Um, it's not easy for white, though, to get it on the road. For example, if we look at this, here, the sacrifice wouldn't work. We can take on f4. That's one problem of sacrificing. Or we can play queen c6 with a, as you could call it, intermediate mate, <laughs> and then take on f7. So it's not easy for white to get this kind of sacrifice going in a correct manner, but it's just important to be aware of the idea and pay attention that they don't get to sacrifice there. So this is how the two knights variation is often unfolding. Yeah? Remember this idea that we play here with b5, that's very important, getting this counterplay started. If we go back, the two knights can start with knight c3 or knight f3. I want to briefly talk about knight f3. This does not have a trainable variation in this course, but it is seen quite a lot, in particular in online games. I think people are often yeah, play knight f3 no matter what. Like they are used to play that at against e4, e5, for example, and they play this here too. I wanted to mention that after d5, the move knight c3 leads to the two knights, but white also can play a different stuff. For example, they could take on d5 or play e5. Those two moves also look fairly um, obvious, right? They don't have any theoretical significance, though. If you think about this, this we will check in a moment from the so-called exchange variation, where white exchanges on d5 and then plays knight f3, just a different move order. Or they can play e5, which after bishop g4 and then e6, c5, will lead to positions that we will examine from the advanced variation, which would happen with the d-pawn played instead of knight f3 played. So this does not have, even though knight f3 is played frequently, 
have much of an independent theoretical significance. Often you will get relatively harmless lines that, um, yeah, that have more dangerous versions yeah, with other move orders. Okay, going back, we have to check a little bit more, like after d4, d5, what else is there? As the e-pawn is attacked, you mostly have to uh, look at the capture on d5 and e5, the so-called advanced variation. I will check next the trade on d5. So e takes, c takes, and now white has a pretty fundamental choice between continuing the development, usually with bishop d3, that is the most testing way of doing that, or playing c4, the so-called Panov attack. They are really completely different. With bishop d3 or another development move like knight f3, for example, they usually just want to yeah, develop the pieces, often play with c3 to have this typical pawn chain, right? Very solid way of playing. Um, with c4, the strategy is completely different as white quickly puts pressure on d5. This is the most, let's say, open variation that they could play, like immediately using every single pawn to open the center. After c4 in the pawn of attack, we often reach so-called isolated queen pawn positions, where the c pawn, white c pawn, will be traded for black's d pawn. So the isolated pawn um, would look, I mean, we don't play that move, I just want to show the structure. This is the, sorry, the isolated pawn. It is um, yeah, isolated in a way it has no uh, pawn on the E or C file that could support it. It is isolated. We don't want to take on C4 though so easily. Um, it's completely unnecessary doing that right now. We want to play knight f6, develop the knight, and right now usually continues with knight c3. Makes more sense to play this knight out first, putting more pressure on d5. I suggest knight c6, just developing the knight. And now we are at an important um, yeah, crossroads point here for the Panov. White has two main continuations and they are pretty different, really. One is the move knight f3, that is the, the main line, the main move most frequently played. And super natural, right? Just develop the knight or the move bishop g5, which we will start with. The move bishop g5 is fundamentally different to knight f3 because it threatens something, and the threat is to take on f6 and then take the d5 pawn. So this move is putting more immediate pressure on our center. Um, Black has some options here, but my recommendation is the capture on c4, taking on c4 now. After this, we clearly have solved the issue of the hanging d5 pawn by just taking. Now, here white has mostly two options. They can play the move d5 or they can recapture. The recapture is believed to be the theoretically most challenging move. However, this is not such a simple move to make as white is giving away the d4 pawn. So it's not such a likely move um, to face if white doesn't know that the d4 pawn actually can be sacrificed. And I don't even recommend taking the pawn. It is possible from a theoretical point of view, black is fine, but you have to learn like to move 20 yeah, of, of complicated theory. And oftentimes if white plays it well, you won't even have chances to win. Not that it's bad, objectively speaking, it's fine to take on d4, in particular with the queen, yeah, but the knight is too risky. Um, but I have a different solution or a different suggestion. Just play e6 here. We'll, um, or we can do this now, but why not? I can show you the point, right? With e6, we just continue with our development plan. Yeah, e6, bishop e7, castles. And this is what we will do. We'll get here. And I think this position is not only perfectly fine for black objectively, but also relatively simple to conduct. You play a6 and play b5 if they allow it. White has only one way of stopping that with playing a4. 
And with a6, b5, we gain space. We allow bishop to b7. And in the long run, we can play against the isolated d-pawn. White has, of course, very uh, fluent and free development. And the active pieces, if you look at these, the pieces are really actively placed. Um, there should always um, kind of um, yeah, be adequate compensation for the um, structural weakness of the d4 pawn. This is also why I like this kind of position because it is offering equal chances, but it is not symmetrical. It's not that white has an easy way of just like ending the game with traits. It's just not so easy to do as we have something to play for. If white stops a6, b5, by the way, with a4, I found the idea queen a5 and rook d8 interesting to put more pressure on the d-pawn. So this is a very, um, yeah, it's a commonly reached position here. Going back, I want to still briefly talk about the move d5 because you would still meet that as well when we go to e5 with the knight. Keep this covered for the moment. And now there's one important moment that I wanted to definitely mention that after queen to d4, that is white's main move here, that against this move when the knight is hanging, we don't want to move the knight and we in particular don't want to give the check, which neglects our development too much. We want to play the move h6. And this finesse is solving black's problems, or problems sounds a bit negative, or is the correct solution to queen d4. White would be better after any other move. Here, we are fine. If white takes, we are definitely fine. We are having great development. E can, uh, bishop can come out. We have the bishop pair. They will go here or here, f4, h4, when we play knight g6 and e6 next to attack the white pawn and complete our development. This is a, a good equal chances position with still something going on, of course. So the main point is to remember that here, after queen to d4, we don't want to check on d3, but play h6 for a counterattack. White can take this, but then we take on g5, and we are also in good shape. Our bishop pair will be very good in the long run. So this is the bishop g5 um, here, the bishop g5 pun off. More frequently, however, you will face knight f3, very natural move. Um, after knight f3, black has two main continuation, but I'm recommending a third move, actually. The two main moves, and I want to mention that because it is important to understand the concept there, bishop g4 and g6 are two popular, the two popular lines for black. In particular, oops, in particular, bishop g4 is popular. After this move, white's best continuation or main continuation is c takes d5, knight takes d5, and queen to b3, putting pressure on b7 and d5. Now, that is not my recommendation, bishop g4. Not because it's bad, but because from here, you would need to learn very, very deep theory up to move 20 and beyond, even deep into an end game. What 